足夠嘅法庭。Members, this is the appointed time. We have a quorum. This is the twenty-second meeting of the Bills Committee. Item one, meeting with the administration. May I welcome the administration to our meeting? We will now discuss the administration's proposed amendments to Clause 93. That's page 53, English version of the paper CB bracket 2304-2024 bracket 01. You may begin. Yes, this Clause 93 relates to cancellation of HKSAR passports, etc. We've added the word etc. And then in this clause, we've changed subclause 3. As you can see, under the track changes mode, there is a new paragraph. The original bracket 3 has been repealed. Some members of the, were of the view that the statutory appeal mechanism under the Hong Kong SAR passports ordinance is obviously not applicable to the cancellation under this section. And the inclusion of subclause 3 may cause confusion. Having considered this view, we propose to delete the subclause. And then we have added this new subclause 3 to deal with a situation in which the absconder um, has applied for the HKSAR passport. If an application for an HKSAR passport is made by a relevant absconder, the application is for the purposes of Section 3.1 of the HKSAR passports ordinance cap 539 and all other purposes to be regarded as being invalid. Now that that means the director of immigration is not uh, required to process the application, and the applicant cannot lodge an appeal. Mr. Kitson Young, yes, this is a clause on HKSAR passports. I want to ask why you've added etc. in the in the, in the heading of the clause. Can you explain the rationale? Yes. We've amended this clause, which relates to the HKSAR passport and its validity period. In fact, it's not the Director of Immigration, but rather the Secretary for Security who should direct that the, SK, uh, the HKSAR passport be cancelled. So we've added the word etc. or in Chinese, dang, to include the, um, the uh, class of travel documents, including uh, the HKSAR passports. Mr. Gary Chen, I share the same concern as Mr. Kisson Yang. I want to ask about the addition of the word etc. in the heading of Clause 93. Well, only if what is set out in the following paragraphs relate something other than the cancellation of HKSR passports should you include etc. But having heard the DS explanation, I'm satisfied. Dr. Kennedy Wong. Now, I have a question on the English text. Now you've added ETC, etc. in the English text after the heading cancellation of HKSAR passports. This, this um, looks peculiar, so uh, please elucidate. And then 93 bracket 3. In fact, I raised this point during the scrutiny of the bill. And I thank the administration for proposing this amendment. 93 bracket 3 involves application for an HKSAR passport, and the application will be deemed invalid. And then in the footnote, the Director of Immigration 
is not required to process the application. Uh, my question is whether there will be a corresponding amendments to other provisions in this regard. Monsieur, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Member, for the questions. Now, let me also explain this addition, etc., to the heading. Now, because we've added subclause three, which relates to application, we need to add etc., because the heading only suggests cancellation of the passport. Under subclause three, the application is regarded as being invalid, and that is true. Under the HKSAR passport ordinance, the Director of Immigration may issue a passport uh, on receipt of an application. And under that ordinance, there is an appeal mechanism against the decision of the Director of Immigration. And we spell out here that for the purpose of this section, the application is deemed invalid and that the appeal mechanism does not apply. Can you answer my question on the English text? LDD will take the question. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for your question. The equivalent um, to the Chinese term dang is etc. In fact, if we take a look at part two, we have treason, etc. And part three, this term is commonly found. In fact, uh, in the other statutes, you will find the same term. Oh, um, so etc. Dot. Must you add uh, the full stop after etc. in its abbreviated form? Is that right, LDD? Yes. If you check the English dictionary, it's quoted ETC full stop. Mr. Lai Tung Thank you, Chairman. I very much welcome the new subclause 3 under clause 93 as proposed by the administration. This is very important. If you cancel a passport, the applicant may file another application. And then under the HKSAR passport ordinance, there is no reason to reject the application. And it is ridiculous and a waste of time to just approve the application, issue the passport, only to cancel it at once. So I think this amendment has perfected the clause. Chairman, if I may, last night when I received the Secretary's email in which this paper is attached, I can't help but feel that despite having such a short time frame, the administration is able to complete the proposed amendments of this length, lengthy bill. And these amendments come with lengthy footnotes. Of course, members have sit through the scrutiny of the bill. Members are all familiar with the rationale. But after all, this is a document released in the public domain. As long as you are well versed in Chinese or English, as a member of the public within and outside Hong Kong, you will have a good understanding of the rationale behind these amendments. I find these footnotes really useful. And in the future, if one wants to find out the rationale behind certain provisions, the legislative intent is clearly spelled out. Now, I haven't joined this council for a long time. Um, this is the first time I come across such an approach. Thumbs up for the administration. I hope that in the future a similar approach can be adopted for the sake of um, legal development in Hong Kong. Mrs. Regina Ip. Chairman, I appreciate that the administration managed to make such a quick decision to repeal the original subclause 3 and add a new subclause here. 
the new subclass 3 only mentions about application for an SAR passport instead of the appeal mechanism. Understand that there will no longer be the appeal mechanism in place. If the passport is cancelled, will the applicant or will the person be able to appeal against the cancellation? We had a detailed discussion last time. This is not to appeal against the decision. So, any decision to be made by the Director of Immigration cannot be appealed against. Thank you. Please carry on. Clause 106A. Chief Executive and Council, Council may make subsidiary legislation for safeguarding national security. We propose to add this clause because members were of the view that this ordinance should, with reference to other ordinances, empower the Chief Executive and Council to make subsidiary legislation for safeguarding national security to further provide for the specific implementation issues in respect of laws relevant to safeguarding national security and deal with any unforeseen circumstances. 106A bracket 1 states that the Chief Executive and Council may make subsidiary legislation for the needs of safeguarding national security and the better carrying into effect of the following laws and interpretation which include A, B and C. A the Hong Kong National Security Law, including provisions in this Chapter 5, and B, the interpretation by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress of Article 14 and Article 47 of the Hong Kong NSL, and C, this ordinance, that is the Safeguarding National Security Ordinance. Subclause 2 states that any subsidiary legislation made under this section may provide that the contravention of the subsidiary legislation is an indictable offence and may prescribe penalties for it of a fine not exceeding $500,000 and imprisonment not exceeding seven years. Dr. Lo Wai Kwok. Part 8 is about mechanisms for safeguarding national security and relevant protections. When we scrutinized this part of the bill, I made this suggestion. That is, we should make it clear in a non-clumsy way what the top level of the government can do to step up the mechanism. So I think Clause 106A proposed here helps make up for the shortcoming of the original bill. So Clause 106A tells people what the top level government can do. So I welcome this amendment. Ms. Kamen Khan. Chairman. When we scrutinized this part of the bill, I remember the administration mentioned that this part of the bill has to be consistent with May 28th decision as well as the Hong Kong NSL so that the two can achieve convergence, compatibility and complementarity. So I think this amendment is appropriate. I think my views have been taken on board by the administration, so I welcome the amendment. I'd like the administration to elaborate on this. That is, the making of subsidiary legislation this way is not unique to Hong Kong. There are other places in the world who may adopt administrative instructions to enhance the mechanism. The laws quoted in A, B, C here can help us deal with any unforeseen circumstances. I just want the administration to clarify that 
the making of subsidiary subsidiary legislation here is not unique to Hong Kong. According to the Basic Law, Article 17, that the um, interpretation of the NPCSC is applicable. I'd like to ask about the penalty for those who contravene the subsidiary legislation. Can you explain the penalty proposed here, please? Who is going to take the question? Miss Hsu. To respond to Ms. Carmen Khan's question, that is whether the making of subsidiary legislation is common. The answer is yes. It is a very common mechanism in Hong Kong. The Legislative Council may empower certain organs to make subsidiary legislation. It is hard to include all kinds of details in the major legislation or the primary legislation. Therefore, we provide for a mechanism to make subsidiary legislation. Also, there are things that the executive authorities are most familiar with. Therefore, the Legislative Council is often empowered to authorize other organs to make subsidiary legislation, and this is commonplace in common law jurisdictions. Deputy Secretary, like Ms. Hsu said, if you look at other places, say in the UK and in the US, these are measures commonly adopted by other countries in the world. As for Clause 106A proposed here, we included a clause concerning penalty here for indictable offences under the law of Hong Kong, there is isn't a maximum penalty. We don't want to give people the wrong perception that there is no penalty for contravening the subsidiary legislation. Therefore, we want to include the penalty here. If there is any subsidiary legislation made under this section, there will be penalty. Mrs. Regina Ip, I'm glad to see that the administration is making this swift amendment to allow the chief executive and council in future to make subsidiary legislation for safeguarding national security. As mentioned by the administration in the UK and the US, there are many subsidiary legislations of this kind. In the National Security Act of the UK, there are 18 schedules. I asked this question previously. Say in the UK, in the National Security Act, apart from the 18 schedules, the government also reviewed their codes of practice. Should we state clearly here that the chief executive can, in accordance with Clause 106A as well as Clause 107, to make codes of practice. The UK did very well in this regard. They empowered the relevant parties to gather certain evidence. Should we state it clearly here as well? Deputy Secretary, in the system of Hong Kong to establish codes of practice, this does not have to be provided for in the law as to whether a code of practice has to be made in accordance with certain legislation. It really depends on whether the relevant legislation is introducing a whole new measure. According to this bill, the police will be given a power, and the power to be given is similar to that they have now. We will talk to the police to see if any special reminders have to be given to the police. If it is the case that the measures existing are already sufficient, then we won't have to establish new codes of practice.
if the chief executive or the CE in council can make subsidiary legislation or codes of practice, will this codes of practice be binding? Deputy Secretary, for some codes of practice, it is stated in the law that they are binding, but for some measures to be put in place, they can be done by way of administrative instructions. Ms. Su, to respond to members' question for codes of practice, contravention of codes of practice does not incur penalty. It is usually the public officers or the police officers that have to comply with uh, codes of practice. If they breach the codes of practice, there would be disciplinary actions normally. So we do not include this in the law because it is not binding for all members of the public. Legal advisor. This is to follow up on questions asked by members just now. Under sub clause 2 here, there is a proposed penalty. I'd like the administration to clarify on this. For sub clause 2, compared to section 18 of cap 1 of our law, that is, any contravention of subsidiary legislation would be considered as an offence, and it is a an offence. It is a summary offence that incurs a fine as well as an imprisonment term, and the penalty set in Cap One how. Does that apply to the penalty here proposed in subclause 2? According to the IGCO, there is a part, unless otherwise specified, we have to follow the interpretation under IGCO. So here we specify a certain level of penalty here, and the IGCO is not applicable here. IGCO is just offers just a general interpretation of the law. It serves kind of like a catch-up provision. If it is not specified in the IGCO, then we adopt the our own level of penalty. It is also specified in some rulings by the court that the executive authorities or the administration may set a certain level of penalty on their own for specific offences. So this is empowered or authorised by the executive authority. Mr. Stanley Ng. Chairman. I welcome this amendment, as the administration has taken on board our suggestions. This addition of the clause is forward-looking, and it allows for the mechanism to be further improved. I wonder under what circumstances would the Chief Executive and Council have to make subsidiary legislations? Is member referring to um, Clause 106A, bracket B? For subclause 1B, it says the interpretation by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress of Article 14 and Article 17 of the Hong Kong NSL should be considered.
there may have to be regulations or rules in place to ensure implementation of the interpretation made by the MPCSC. So we want to allow room in future for the Chief Executive and Council to make subsidiary legislations to ensure smooth implementation of the interpretation. Is this about oath-taking? No, this is about the duties and power of the Committee for Safeguarding National Security as well as the certificates that can be issued by the Chief Executive. Mr. Gary Chen. We have mentioned time and again that we may see different risks to national security as we move with the times. So I think it is necessary for us to allow the chief executive in council to make subsidiary legislation for safeguarding national security. This will allow us to move with the times and I think this is a very practical provision. It will allow us to cope with any unforeseen risks that we may see in the future. So I welcome the addition of this clause. Mr. Jeffrey Lam. Safeguarding national security should be our top priority. So it is definitely necessary for us to have this clause here. And I find the provisions here very reasonable. I find the explanation offered by the administration very straightforward and clear to understand as well. Thank you. There being no further questions, administration, please carry on. Thank you. Please refer to page 56 of the English version. Clause 107, administrative instructions in connection with safeguarding national security. The purpose of this clause is to clarify that in addition to stipulating that the chief executive can issue administrative instructions to any public servant, it also stipulates that relevant administration instructions can be issued to any department or agency of the government. And the relevant department and agency must comply with the instructions. So we have added the wording department or agency of the government here. Mr. Tony Che. I'd like to ask about uh, clause 107A. If there are no uh, questions on clause 107, let's move on to clause 107A. Yes, I believe Deputy Chair would also like to ask about clause 107A. Clause 107A is about judgments and decisions of National Security Committee. This amendment is proposed because members were of the view that one of the purposes of enacting a new safeguarding national security ordinance is to fully implement the constitutional responsibilities and obligations stipulated in the May 28th decision and the Hong Kong NSL. The interpretation of Article 14 and Article 47 of the NSL was adopted by the MPCSE in 2022, but the interpretation wasn't reflected in local legislation. Therefore, the relevant requirements should be clearly included in the bill to ensure that if the law of the Hong Kong SAR confers any function on a person, any person in making any decision in the performance of the function must respect and execute the judgments and decisions of the National Security Committee. There is a subclass one here. It states that a meeting of the National Security Committee is to be convened by the chairperson, and the National Security Advisor is to sit in on meetings of the committee. The advisor is to provide advice on matters relating to the duties and functions of the committee. Subclause 2 here states that the Secretariat of the committee is to convey and assist in the follow-up of and in the giving of effect to the judgments and decisions made by the committee. 
Subclause 3 states that if the law of the SAR confers any function on a person, any person in making any decision in the performance of the function must respect and implement the judgments and decisions of the committee. Mr. Tung Lee Tae, thank you, Chairman. Regarding Clause 107A, I'd like to ask some questions. Mainly, my question concerns the Standing Committee of NPC, that is the interpretation of Article 14 and Article 47 of the Hong Kong National Security Law. I'd like to ask for the interpretation of the relevant articles Any person or any organization should not interfere with the um, work of safeguarding national security. So is that included with the current textual amendments? That is, um, any person must respect and implement the judgments and decisions of the National Security Committee. So if one does not respect or implement any function, what is the legal consequence? Thank you, Chairman. Let me first speak on the implication of the decision in 2022. The National Security Committee in accordance with Article 14, the NSC can make judgments and decisions whether something concerns national security, and that is legally binding. And any function, I mean, any organization must respect and implement the judgments and decisions of the National Security Committee NSC in accordance with the law. So that is interfacing between that and local legislation. Any follow-up from the DOJ? Mainly, that is partly reflected in Article 14 of the National Security Law. The work of the NSC should not be interfered with by any person or any organization. And the decision made by the NSC is not subject to any judicial review. As members said, the interpretation is very clear. The judgments and decisions of the NSC must be respected and implemented in accordance with law. Deputy Chair, thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank the government for accepting my views as well as members' views by way of adding 107A. As we said, the NSC performs like the brain when it, com when it comes to safeguarding national security. It wouldn't be complete without the National Security Committee. By adding 107A, the Safeguarding National Security Bill can better complement um, the basic law and the national security law. I support this amendment. Next, Mr. Holden Chow. For sure, I support the amendment. That is the addition of 107A to provide for the role of the NSC. Please refer to 107A. Let's refer to the um, footnote, footnote 37. I can see that the um, Standing Committee of the NPC on the 30th of December 2022 interpreted Article 14 and Article 47 of the Hong Kong National Security Law. But the interpretation was not reflected in local legislation. I'd like to see if my understanding is correct. 
based on the interpretation of the law of the Understanding Committee of the MPC on retaining foreign lawyers in national security cases in the Legislative Council regarding the Legal Practitioners Ordinance, we also made relevant amendments. Back then, I was also one of the member in the committee. I'd like to know whether my understanding is correct. In amending the Legal Practitioners Ordinance, that is actually reflected in local legislation. I'd like to know well, I mean, the interpretation of the relevant law is quite detailed. I'd like to know why, in a footnote, it says the interpretation was not reflected in local legislation. Was there anything left undone? Thank you, member, for your question and recommendation. Indeed, the amendment to the Legal Practitioner's Office is to give effect to the interpretation of the law of Article 14 and Article 47 of the Hong Kong National Security Law. As we said, we need to be forward-looking and we lay down the principles clearly. Once again, the interpretation forms part of the national security law per se, but in local legislation, it is not reflected yet. So we need to state the principle. That is, we want to see interfacing of safeguarding national security law and Article 14 and Article 47. We want to address members' concerns, and that is the reason why we include this remark right here, Dr. Kennedy Wong. 106A, it's very clear by way of subsidiary legislation, whereas in 107, it is about the administrative instruction of the chief executive. Right now, we have 107A that is about the judgments and decisions of the NSC. I'd like the administration to explain to the public I mean, um, the difference in the weight between the administrative instructions of the chief executive and the judgments and decisions of the National Security Committee. What are the consequences of not obeying these judgments and decisions? In 107A, it says judgments and decisions. We don't read into these in the literal sense. Only in court setting do we use in these terms. In order to avoid misunderstanding, is there any better alternative to pundun, as in judgment in English? As both words are in English judgments. There are a couple of questions from members. Thank you, member. First of all, regarding the administrative instructions issued by the chief executive, that's two separate matters. An administrative instruction is issued to any department or agency of the government. That is like an internal instruction. In compliance with the administrative instruction is subject to disciplinary action. Whereas the judgments and decisions of NSC are different. They can make judgments and decisions in, re in relation to national security cases. In many cases, and these are reflected in local law, which need to be respected and implemented in accordance with the law. Failing which, we will have to make reference to law to see what the consequence may be. We act in accordance with law. What about the English text? The word judgment is different from the judgment in our everyday sense. Judgment in its ordinary concept are like judgments 
that can be made by you and me as well. They should be read in a general sense. Ms. Carmen can. The DOJ explain the reasons why this clause is added. So in the scrutiny on the principal legislation, we mention providing for the role of the NSC, including the um, role as explained by the Standing Committee of the MPC on the 30th of December 2022 in the course of the interpretation of Articles 14 and 47. That forms part of the national security law in Hong Kong. So I can see the necessity. That's the first point I'd like to say. Next, I'd like to ask about subclause 3. I'd like to see whether this is in line with the explanation. Subclause 3, if the law of the Hong Kong SAR confers any function on a person, any person in making any decision in the performance of the function must respect and implement in accordance with the law the judgments and decisions of the NSC. It's a target. Any function on a person or any person is at the target from the DOJ? Yes, I go along with Ms. Carmen Khan completely. Your understanding is completely correct. Yes, that is the key is to implement in accordance with law. Whatever law, duties, responsibilities we have with laws of Hong Kong, everyone must implement all these in accordance with law. Mr. Sen Li Ng, I welcome the addition of 107A which provides for the role of the NSC. This connects different pieces of the national security law. In subclause 2 under clause 107A, the Secretariat of the NSC is to convey and assist in the follow-up of, well, can you explain the um, target being conveyed to? Well, it depends on the department being conveyed to. Well, I mean that is you convey something to a particular department, and that is exactly the target. Well, Mr. Stanley, mm, can you speak into the microphone? Thank you. In the footnote of 107A, should it be consistent as well? Otherwise, this may give rise to misunderstanding. The footnote... Uh, well, I think in the um, in the um, legislation, it won't. There won't be any such problems. It will be sorted out. Mr. Chen Siu Hong, in subclause three of subclause one o seven a, together with one o seven and one o six a, all these show part B, the mechanisms for safeguarding national security and the relevant protections. In the scrutiny of the bill, when we read 107, administrative instructions in connection with safeguarding national security, it does not seem to be in line with the title. It doesn't match the title. But now the addition of the relevant clauses provide interfacing, plucking the gap. Not just public servant, I mean not just public servants need to comply with the administrative instructions issued by the chief executive, but we all need to respect and implement the judgments and decisions made by the NSC. All these three interconnect with one another, only then can we safeguard national security. So I fully support these amendments. These are very clear amendments. Just now, member asked about subclause 2 under 
under Clause 107A, Mr. Stanley Ng also asked about the Secretariat of National Security conveying and assisting in, well, there's a lack of specific details. The Secretariat of the NSC is to convey and assist in the follow-up of and the giving of the fact to, whereas there is a lack of the target. There is no mentioning of the target at all. It simply provides for the function or role of the NSC. But I think that the Secretariat of the NSC does not only work on conveying or assisting in the follow-up of and the giving of effect to. It's actually not just a top-level mechanism. Yes, I completely agree with member. Mr. Tommy Chang. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to give my views. As many members have said regarding one clause 108 and 107A, I go along with all of them. The Liberal Party and the commercial sector would like to say that we support the role of the NSC in safeguarding national security. Thank you, Chairman. Dr. Kennedy Wong. I must say to the administration again, according to Cambridge English Dictionary and English Chinese Dictionary, when it comes to the spelling of judgment, there is no E in the spelling of judgment. Well, is there a difference between UK spelling and US spelling? Well, um, according to the um, interpretation of Article 14 and Article 47 of the Hong Kong National Security Law, as explained by the Standing Committee of the MPC in the English version of the interpretation, the word judgment has an E. That is exactly why we also use judgment as in the version there is an E. So um, the um, Chinese the law is actually in, in Chinese version. So what is the effect of the English version was it provided by the standing committee of the MPC? No, that is not correct. I mean, it's a non-official English version. According, well, based on what I know, in the U.S. spelling there is no e, whereas in the um, U.K. version there is e. I mean, there is just a spelling between UK and US. On 108, public servants to us, uh, well, 107B provision of advice or giving of directions in relation to national security education. In the bill, The Chief Secretary for Administration may provide advice or give any direction to any person whom the, Chief ex whom the Chief Secretary for Administration considers appropriate for promoting national security education, raising the awareness of residents of the Hong Kong SAR of national security and of the obligation to abide by the law. Mr. Sen Li Ng, I thank the Administration for taking on board my view and adding 107. Education plays a pivotal role in safeguarding national security law. So I think it's, it's good to have this clause. It also provides for the contract function or role of the Chief Secretary for Administration that is that is he provides advice or give any direction in terms of 
guidance, supervision, and regulation. So I'd like to clarify. Do you mean any person engaging in national security education? Can you tell us a little bit more clearly? Thank you. Are you my yes. The, in the view of the Chief Secretary for Administration, right? Yes. The person whom the CSYA considers appropriate, then the advice will be given. It's up to the CSYA to decide. Mr. Tony Chair. I thank the administration for responding to members' comments that national security education is of utmost importance. Well, I stand to be corrected, but here the Chief Secretary for Administration may, and with emphasis on the word may, provide advice or give any direction. Chairman, I seem to recall a similar situation in the National Anthem Ordinance. There is a provision in which the Secretary for Education must, in Chinese, so provide advice or give direction to primary and secondary schools on national anthem education. Here, I see in English it says may. Does it mean that the Chief Secretary may provide advice or give direction only? Hence, the Chinese use of the word hall. Law officer, yes, the I confirm the members' understanding. The CS4A may provide advice or give direction. Apart from the functions you refer to, legally speaking, there is also an obligation to do so. Correct, Chairman. The executive, judiciary, and the legislature are all obliged to safeguard national security. And here it provides that every person has a duty to safeguard national security as well. Mrs. Regina Ip, this is an important provision. It provides the CSA a statutory obligation so that there is a statutory role to play for the CSYA. About provision of advice or giving of directions, there is no legally uh, binding force, uh, so to speak, and there is no penalty for contravention. Is that right? Yes, Mrs. Ip is right, but it depends on the to whom the direction is given. Say if the direction is given to civil servants, then civil servants should obey the direction or face disciplinary action for non compliance. Please continue. Next clause one oh eight public servants to assist in the work of I mean work on safeguarding national security. In scrutiny of the bill, members are of the view that although the provision already stipulates that any public servant must provide all assistance as necessary for the work on safeguarding national security, the provision should be further improved to spell out the specific responsibilities. We therefore propose to add sub clauses 2 and 3. A public servant must provide any department or agency that is responsible for the work on safeguarding national security and its personnel in the HKSAR with all reasonable facilitation, support, backing, protection in a timely manner, including providing the necessary manpower and other necessary resources in a timely manner. And then sub clause 3, a public servant must exercise all powers and discretions that the public servant has, including any power and discretion concerning the giving of any exemption to discharge the obligation under this section. Dr. Kennedy Wong. I mentioned that it is the top priority for every public servant to safeguard national security. 
I see a number of key words in the proposed amendment. First, in Chinese, so or in English, must. A public servant must provide any department or agency that is, that is responsible for safeguarding national security, so on and so forth, in a timely manner. This is uh, so said in the English version. With all for reasonable facilitation, support, backing, and protection. So I fully support uh, this expression. Uh, which is very clear. Deputy Chair, I remember when we examined Clause 108, it came with only one sentence. A public servant must provide all such assistance that is necessary for the work on safeguarding national security. I don't think this is specific enough, and that is why the administration is proposing adding subclasses 2 and 3, such as providing necessary manpower and necessary resources and exercising all powers and discretions. Indeed, this is an improvement. What if public servant is still lackluster in fulfilling the obligations under the ordinance. Um, can follow-up action be taken under the Civil Service Code or other regulations? Deputy Chair has made a very good point. This is not a penalty clause, but as a civil servant, one must be fully dedicated to his duties. Or else, uh, in terms of appraisal and disciplinary matters, there will be follow-up action. Mr. Jeffrey Lam, I appreciate the improvement to Clause 108. I think, as discussed, obligations, these are the most important things. Every civil servant should be dedicated to their duties. They need to have a sense of responsibility. So on top of the addition here, I think that we should hammer home this message through the Civil Service College. I think this should be included as the curriculum for civil servants. And then the head of departments, the heads of departments, should also be made responsible for setting out the duties and obligations of civil servants in their respective units. Now that you've put it down in black and white, the government should follow up on this clause. Now that it's in black and white, we need to make sure that it is effectively implemented. Any comment? No? Let's move on to the next one. Thank you, Chairman. Clause 111, page 60 of the English version. The original clause relates to signing or certification of legal documents in respect of cases concerning national security. We're proposing this amendment in light of members' views during the scrutiny of the bill. Under some circumstances, officers handling cases not relating to national security may also be doxed. In order to protect persons handling non-national security cases that involve defendants of national security cases, The amendment is proposed to expand the scope of the mechanism under this clause so that specified cases cover not only national security cases, but also a case in which a party to the case is also a party to proceedings instituted for the party's offense concerning national security. Which means, first of all, there is an amendment to the heading of Clause 111 Instead of cases concerning national security, it's now specified cases. There will be a reference to the specified case. There is also a corresponding amendment under subclause 1. Now, if we turn to page 63, after subclause 6, there are two new subclasses. 6 capital A refers to what a specified case 
means. Now, as I explained, there are two types of cases. And uh, may I draw members' attention to proce uh, proceedings that are brought against a person for the offence endangering national security, and the person is a party to a case. And then six capital B, for the purposes of subsection six capital A B, proceedings for an offence endangering national security are brought against a person if a a magistrate issues a warrant or summons against a person um, under the magistrate's ordinance in respect of the offence. B, the person is arrested for the offence, whether or not the person is released on bail. C, the person is charged with the offence after being taken into custody without a warrant. D, an indictment charging the person with the offence is preferred by the direction or with the consent of a judge under Section 24, Capital A, 1B of the Criminal Procedure Ordinance. So, um, in such circumstances, uh, that means proceeding for an offence endangering national security are brought against a person. I thank the administration for taking on board our suggestions. For the cases concerned, it should not be limited to national security cases that the officer is dealing with. For judges and officers handling non-national security cases, subsequently they may be doxxed or attacked. So we need to pro um, we need these amendments to provide protection to these officers carrying out carrying out national security related duties to protect them from possible doxing. So um, I appreciate the administration for taking on board our suggestions. Just to comment, no response needed. Clause one one three, capital A, please. These are new clauses one one three A and one one three B. The amendments are proposed taking into account members' views during scrutiny of the bill that there is a possibility that officers handling cases not related to national security may also be doxxed. 113A, specified court may on application take anonymity measures. Subclass 1, if a specified court is satisfied that it is necessary for safeguarding national security to take certain measures in relation to any existing or contemplated proceedings, regardless of whether the proceedings concern a case concerning national security and regardless of whether the proceedings take place in that court or any other court, to protect the identity of any specified person from disclosure, the Specified court may, on ex parte application by the Secretary for Justice, order the measures be taken. Subse uh, subclass 2, without limiting subsection 1, an order made under that subsection may prohibit a person from disclosing two types of information. A, information that shows the identity of a specified person, or B, information from which the identity of a specified person may be inferred. Subclass 3, a hearing of an application under subsection 1 must take, uh, take place in a closed court. Subclause 4, if an, order, if an order is made under subsection 1, a person affected by the order may apply to the specified court to vary or revoke the order. Subclause 5, the specified court must not vary or revoke the order unless the specified court, having regard to all the circumstances of the case, is satisfied that injustice will be caused if the order is not varied or revoked. Subclass 6, to avoid doubt, unless the specified court orders otherwise, the Secretary for Justice need not, for the purposes of an application under subsection 4, provide to the applicant documents submitted to the specified court at the time when the Secretary for Justice made the application under subsection 1. Subclass 7, uh, to avoid doubt, this section does not limit any other power that any court may exercise, and Section 111 does not prevent a specified court from ordering under Subsection 1 any measures to be taken in relation to a document mentioned in 111 Subclause 2. 
subclause eight, we're providing some definitions, such as what a specified person means. That is, in relation to any existing or contemplated proceedings, means the following person whom the proceedings involve are likely to involve a a public servant, b a judicial officer or staff member of the judiciary, c a counsel or solicitor, or d an informer or witness. Specified court means any of the following courts of the judiciary of the HKSAR, and we see various courts listed out. I'm not going to repeat those. Mr. Holden Chow. Thank you, Chairman. I welcome the proposed amendments by adding clauses 113A and 113B. I think that uh, they have to do with the injunction against disclosure of details of certain person. Now, for specified court in 113A, my understanding is that 113A relates to certain legal proceedings. Say this specified court may have ordered that the disclosure of the identity of a person is banned, and yet specified court. I see the definition refers to the court of final appeal, the court of appeal, CFI district court, and magistrates court. What happens is that there may be a case not directly related to national security, and there may be relevant proceedings going on in other levels of, or in other courts relating to national security. This person may not wish the particulars to be disclosed, and how should it be dealt with? These courts are at the moment not included in the definition. I just want to know how the court will handle the matter. Monsieur, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Member, for the questions. For specified court in 113A, we refer to the court in which the application is to be made. In fact, if you turn to 111, it explains how the documents are to be signed. Say if the documents are to be signed by this person, then the organization or the party may sign the document on their behalf. And then um, for the protection measures, it's for the court to decide. By court, we mean a specified court, and that is the court set out in the definition. But there is no limitation as to the legal proceedings referred to in a particular court. All right, understood, clear enough, Dr. Loy Kwok. In examining the relevant provisions, other members and myself have made comments on officers handling national security cases and even non national security cases. We ask whether the protection measures for them against unlawful harassment or doxing are sufficient. I also ask whether we'd be um, too lenient on the perpetrators if the measures are too uh, lax. So I welcome the addition of 113A and 113B. What happened in 2019 was really antagonizing. The public are grieved by the, dox the acts of doxing. They definitely deserve more protection written in. Thank you. Noted. Next administration will take the floor now. One one three B offense of contravening order prohibiting disclosure of identity. While well, we give the same consideration as one one three A, we consider the risk faced by 
officers handling non-national security cases. If a person, knowing that an order prohibiting disclosure of identity has been made, discloses information, the, the disclosure of which is prohibited by the order, the person commits an offence and is liable to imprisonment for five years. Two, it is an offence where a person charged, I mean, it is a defence where a person charged with an offence under subsection 1 to establish that the person had a reasonable excuse or lawful authority to make the disclosure. Subclause 3 relates to the evidential burden and the onus of proof. 3. A person is taken to have established matter that needs to be established for defence under subsection 2 if a. There is sufficient evidence to raise an issue with respect to the matter and b. The contrary is not proved by the prosecution beyond reasonable doubt. 4. If a. Any Hong Kong SAR resident, body corporate that is incorporated, formed or registered in the HASAR, or body of persons, whether corporate or unincorporated, that has a place of business in the HASAR, does an act outside the HASAR, and the act would have constituted an offence under subsection 1 had it been done in the HASAR, the resident or body commits an offence. So this is about extraterritorial effect. Subsection 5 is a definition relating to the order prohibiting uh, disclosure of identity means an order made under section 113A1 prohibiting any person from making the disclosure mentioned in 113A2. Thank there being no further questions, please move on. Clause 119 is about amending companies winding up and miscellaneous provisions ordinance. It concerns section 360C, excluding the relevant companies. Upon review, we propose further amendments to sections 360C and 360N of the ordinance to deal with the situation where a member of a company which has become an unlawful society after its registration is cancelled by order made by the CE in Council due to non-national security reasons, such as public safety, may need to participate in the course of the winding up of the company, for instance, attending the general meeting in the capacity of a member of the company for legitimate reasons. But the member may be subject to criminal liability in connection with unlawful society under the society's ordinance. Please refer to page 68 of the English version. We're adding bracket 2a here, certain wording. And we're also deleting the mention of the society's ordinance. We're also removing the part about Division 2 of Part 6 of the Safeguarding National Security Ordinance. Instead, we are adding bracket 2b, which states that if a person is, because of the operation of this section, required to act as a member of an unlawful society or prohibited organization to deal with matters arising from the winding up or dissolution of the society or organization, the person does not commit any offense under the society's ordinance or the Safeguarding National Security Ordinance only because the person so acts. For subclass 3, we're adding after section 360C bracket 3, subsection 4. And subsection 4 provides for definition of prohibited organization, which means a prohibited organization within the meaning of Division 2 of Part 6 of the Safeguarding National Security Ordinance. And we are adding the definition for unlawful society as well. Mr. Jeffrey Lam, I think this amendment is important. Some groups or organizations may seem normal from the service. But in fact, they might be engaging in illeg unlegitimate acts. 
so there is a it provides for a very clear guideline for enforcing the law so i support this amendment there being no other questions we move on to clause 122 Clause 122 amends Section 360N, which targets non-Hong Kong companies. You can see on page 71 of the English version that we are proposing similar amendments. We are removing some of the wording in the original clauses, and we are proposing to add subclauses 3 and 4 here, which is similar to clause 199. Questions? If not, let's move on to clause 126. Clause 126 amends section 2 of the society's ordinance, which has to do with the interpretation. For the definition of political organization of an external place, it includes certain groups and organizations. Bracket B here originally states that it includes the authority of a region or place of an external place. But the definition of an external place has already included a region or place, so we propose to remove the wording a region or place here. Please carry on. Please refer to page 75 of the English version. It is about clause 158, and it amends the official secrets ordinance. It is an amendment to the definition of international organization, same as that proposed for the earlier clause. It is the same amendment as to the one mentioned earlier this morning. If there are no further questions, please move on to Clause 177A. Clause 177A amends Chief Executive Election Ordinance in relation to disqualification from voting. Upon review, it is noted that, that the cross-reference uh, was omitted. So, we propose to add bracket CA after bracket B in the provision. Can the administration confirm that you have gone through all amendments made in the Chinese version? All right, now please walk us through the part that only concerns amendments to the English version of the bill. Thank you. Please refer to The first page of the English version, which is the preamble. In bracket C here, originally it states that to protect the lawful rights and interests of the residents of the Hong Kong SAR and other people, and we propose to revise it to other persons instead of other people upon the request made by members. Please carry on. The next amendment that only concerns the English version is Clause 15. Please refer to page 9. It's about the offence of insurrection. There was a typo here. For Clause 15a, Originally was drafted as a person joins an armed force or be a part of an armed force. Now we change it to or is a part of an armed force. Next, clause 39. Please refer to page 17 of the English document. Clause 39, interpretation. There is a an interpretation for the word conveyance. 
In the original version, it says conveyance includes a vehicle, vessel, aircraft, or hovercraft. We noted that there is a typo here, and we propose to change or to end. Thank you. Please continue. Now we come to clause 45. It's on page 23 of the English document. Clause 45 is about participating in or supporting external intelligence organizations or accepting advantages offered by them, etc. Under Clause 45, subclause 1b, it is a regionally drafted that the person knowingly do a prohibited act in relation to an external intelligence organization. And again, there is a typo, and we propose to change do to does. Now we come to clause 80. Please refer to page 45 and page 46 of the English document. The amendment is on page 46. It is about the movement restriction order. It, the amendment concerns clause 80 sub clause 2A2. Originally, it states that the person must report to the police by the specified deadline. But now we correct it to the person on bail must report to the police. Next, clause 102 is on page 54 of the English document. On page 54, the amendment concerns clause 102, sub clause 2. Originally, in the second line, we used the singular form of order, but we now propose to change it to the plural form, which is orders. Next, clause 109. It's about chief executive to issue certificate in relation to question of whether national security or state secret is involved. The amendment is in clause 109 sub clause 1. The last line of this provision, we propose to change secret to secrets. And you remove the word is in the heading of the clause, is that right? Yes. Yes, we remove the word is and we change the singular form to plural form for state secret. Legal advisor. Now the heading reads chief executive to issue certificate in relation to question of whether national security or state secret is involved. Should we keep is or should we not keep it? Is it your intent to remove the word is because there might be some confusion? If we use secrets, that is the plural form in the heading, it should be national security or state secrets are involved or in the singular form secrets is involved. But it sounds clumsy. Oftentimes for heading, we only include the keywords. Therefore, we propose to remove is here. I also find it a bit strange because involved may read as the past tense of the verb. It should be read as a passive voice of the verb instead of the past tense of the verb. Mrs. Regina, if you have the same question, I think we should keep the verb is because the noun should be question instead of secrets. That is, in relation to question of whether national security or state secret is involved, is here refers to the noun question instead of secret. I think 
There is some grammatical issue here. Please take this into consideration. Any further questions, legal advisor? Ms. Carmen Khan. Chairman. Page 54, clause 102, footnote 34. According to the administration, it proposes to change order into orders. I'm referring to page 54 of the English version. Footnote 34. According to the administration, there is a typo in the English text. That is clause 102 sub clause 2. The administration proposes to change the singular form into plural form. It should be changed to a third person singular instead of changing it into plural form. That's why you change it to orders. Please continue. Please consider our suggestion on clause 109. Have you walked us through the amendment in subclause 1 of clause 109? All right, please move on to clause 111. Chairman, for amendments that only concern the English version, we have gone through all the amendments. The other amendments are made in accordance with the Chinese version. Thank you. Legal advisor. Do we have further drafting or legal issues that we have to look at? We have looked at the Chinese and English text, and we confirm that we have covered all the issues. We have gone through all the committee stage amendments for both the Chinese and English version of the bill. Members, do you? endorse the amendments proposed by the administration. Since we have completed the relevant discussion, I want to ask members if we agree with the uh, to resume the second reading of the bill as early as possible. All right. Secretary for Justice, Mr. Paul Lam, please make a concluding remark. Thank you, Chairman. On behalf of the SAR government, I'd like to thank the Chairman, the Deputy Chair of the Bills Committee, as well as every member and the Secretariat Legal Advisor of this committee, as well as other personnel. You have, in the past week, worked day in and day out so that we can complete the scrutiny of this bill. On the, 20, on the 8th of March, I mentioned in my opening remarks that there are five main points to the bill. It is drafted with the common wording we use in our current legislation, and it allows uh, the public to understand the content of the bill, and also it achieves convergence, complementarity, as well as compatibility with the Hong Kong NSL. Also, we have made reference to the um, other overseas jurisdiction practices. However, we also have to stick to the situation in Hong Kong as we draft the bill. It also helps plug the loophole of the existing legal system. I hope we managed to convince all members of this committee as well as the general public that the SAR government has um, st stuck to the five principles that I mentioned just now. Members raised valuable suggestions, comments, as well as questions as we scrutinized the bill. It also allows the administration to respond two important objectives have been achieved. It allows us to reflect on how we can improve the drafting of the bill, and that's why we submitted the CSA this morning. 
also it allowed us room to respond to members' questions and the scrutiny of the bill also allowed us the opportunity to let the public know what national security risk we may face and what kind of difficulties we may uh, come across as we implement the bill. The legislature and the executive has worked together to complete the Article 23 legislation. That is, we showed our determination to legislate for Article 23. We are very close to completing our mission. We have already waited for nearly 27 years to complete the legislative exercise. We have to ensure that we are implementing a high quality bill. And the bill's committee's work proves that we are ensuring um, that the bill is a high quality one. I hope that we can complete the legislative exercise as early as possible so that we can all have peace of mind and work together and focus on working towards the um, well-being and livelihood of the general public. Mr. Chris Tang, thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank all members of the Bills Committee for scrutinizing the bill over the past week. We raised against the clock to scrutinize the bill of safeguarding national security. And I also thank, in all sincerity, legal advisors as well as members for their very valuable comments. We have incorporated these comments into the, into the amendments in order to improve the safeguarding national security bill. I'd like to point out that the Hong Kong SAR government has the responsibility for implementing five to eight decision national security bill as well as um, the um, law that upholds national security to make sure that the relevant mechanism is complete and practicable so that we can effectively safeguard national security. We will also the local legislation in relation to um, safeguarding national security is in line with um, Hong Kong NSL. I need to emphasize human rights and rights of citizens will be better protected as these are in line with one another. Safeguarding national security is to better protect citizens of Hong Kong as well as other persons in Hong Kong. We need to protect the freedoms, the rights, as well as the property and investments in Hong Kong. These are protected by law. National security offenses target a minority of people who, who would um, like to sabotage the safety of Hong Kong. We need to protect the freedoms and rights of the people in Hong Kong. We also need to cement the status of Hong Kong, strengthen Hong Kong's advantage, so that other activities can, can continue to be implemented in Hong Kong. In A3 of Ming Pao, I'd like to point out there is a misleading article, and I have to strongly condemn such an article. The headline is that Article 23 empowers the Chief Executive CE in Executive Council, the media, um, that is, the offenders can be sent to mainland. An ordinary, an ordinary person may misunderstand that Article 23 has provisions that regulate media behavior, and there are some offenses that can send offenders to mainland China, but this is incorrect. This is false. The Safeguarding National Security Bill does not have any provisions on media. They don't target media at all. All these offenses will be heard in Hong Kong. Well, I think this title is incorrect. It is evil. As I said, these are wrong ideas. These are wrong headlines. These headlines may affect Hong Kong people. They may make people of Hong Kong misunderstand 
Article 23 and give rise to unnecessary concerns. As a team leader of the rebuttal team, I need to strongly condemn the report of Meng Pao. This report once again affects the credibility of Meng Pao. I understand that Meng Pao has already made um, clarification and apology online, but damage has been done. I hope that Meng Pao can mend his ways, correctly report Article 23, as well as other relevant reports. These are the basic principles of the media, and I believe that Meng Pao is, is in a better position than I am. Basic law, international conventions, confidence, that is ICCPR and ISESCR are applicable to local legislation. Common law and Article 5 of the Hong Kong NSL mention the basic principle of the rule of law. This will stay applicable to local legislation and the offenses un under local legislation. We have already finished discussing all the offenses under the Safeguarding National Security Law. They have also provided for defense as well as um, suitable circumstances and provisions. Crimin criminal intent will have to be proven. Those innocent will not be on the wrong side of the law inadvertently. These mechanisms have been seriously considered. There are also sufficient um, limitations. All these are in, in com full comp are in full compliance of the um, basic law. I hope the Legislative Council will resume the second reading debate as soon as possible, as well as the third reading of the bill, so the gap can be plucked in terms of safeguarding national security. There will also be fewer national security risks. The mechanism of safeguarding national security will also be improved further. This has shown that the executive and the um, legislature have resolved to safeguard national security. The earlier we finish the legislative exercise, the earlier we can safeguard national security. On behalf of the Hong Kong SAR government, I'd like to thank the Legislative Council once again. I'd like to thank the DOJ and the Security Bureau for their tireless work, your professionalism, showcases the um, result-oriented approach and high efficiency of the current term government. I'd like to thank you in all sincerity. This is my concluding remarks. Thank you, Chairman. Since last Friday on the 8th of March, the government gazetted the Safeguarding National Security Bill. On the very same day, the Legislative Council convened a meeting in the morning to deal with the first reading and the second reading of the bill. On the very same day in the afternoon, the Bills Committee also started clause-by-clause -clause scrutiny of the bill in the afternoon of last Friday. The Subcommittee and the Bills Committee have held a total of 25 meetings. almost 50 hours of scrutiny of the bill. The Bills Committee have already convened meetings seven days in a row, from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. There was also preparatory work. We have already finished reviewing policy issues of the bill, clause by clause, scrutiny, as well as the scrutiny of the committee stage amendments have been completed. We are in the final stretch of the scrutiny of the bill. All members of the bill's committee have discharged their responsibilities, scrutinizing every single clause in great detail, 
as a chairman on the bills committee, I didn't draw any line in terms of the time. I let members ask, speak, and air their views. I didn't stop any member of the bills committee or any official from the government from speaking or answering questions. We spent over one hour scrutinizing Clause 76 and over one hour scrutinizing Clause 113. If my memory serves me correctly, scrutinizing Clause 113 took us more than one hour, 20 minutes. There were also many clauses on which we spent more than half an hour. This is not common. Members asked to the point questions. I didn't need to question the um, relevance of the questions raised by members. This shows that members are fully prepared. And I also came to notice more senior members writing on their professionalism and experience raised questions to the administration. Less senior members also ask thought-provoking questions. Some of the members are less senior in this bill's committee, and this has a positive impact on the succession of the Legislative Council. I need to thank members for your professionalism and devotion into the scrutiny of the bill. As I said, scrutinizing the bill as early as possible does not mean that we are reckless in our scrutiny. I thank the administration for your resolve and sense of great responsibility. You have been responding to members' questions with great devotion. A rough estimate shows that members have asked over 1,000 questions on the bill. Or I should put it this way, over 1,000 and by far more than 1,000 questions. The administration worked hard to answer each and every single question asked by the members of the bills committee. They clear, um, I mean, they cleared up misunderstandings and let the public know the legislative intent and the relative specifics. I also thank the administration for taking on board our views, being receptive to our ideas. I also need to thank the secretariat and the team. They also work very high, work very hard. Back office. The officials could focus on scrutinizing the bill. The marathon-style scrutiny of the bill left us with very few time to have lunches and dinners. We spend much time scrutinizing the bill. This shows the um, high-quality governance and the discussion of governance or politics in the Legislative Council. I also thank the President of the Council. All members of the Bills Committee, be they officials, members, or staff members, their professionalism and contributions are witnessed by society, and these are all seen by society. Their work just cannot be doubted or smeared by people with ulterior motives. I believe when the bill resumes a second reading debate in the Legislative Council, all members will do their level best to pluck the last gap in terms of safeguarding national security. As the chief executive said, the earlier we can finish the legislative, legislative exercise, the earlier we can safeguard national security. I believe all members will take part in this very important task. I thank all members. As S4J and the um, S4S said, 
we need to complete the legislative exercise as soon as possible, as the Bills Committee has already finished the um, scrutiny of the bill. I suggest that the Bills Committee, I mean I should report to the House Committee tomorrow the work on the um, scrutiny of the bill. I believe members will also support my decision. There's no any other business. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.